Welcome to the University of New South Wales, Canberra, Australian Naval History podcast series. Produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, Navy Sea Power Centre and the Submarine Institute. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Greg Swindon, a Naval Reserve Officer and now Senior Naval Historical Officer at the Sea Power Centre Australia. Today we are at the Australian Centre for the Study of Armed Conflict at the Defence Force Academy. The centre hosts the very active Naval Studies Group at UNSW Canberra. Please visit our website. To find us, simply Google Navy Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. This podcast is the first in a series focusing on the Royal Australian Navy and the Great War of 1914-18, what we also call the First World War. This part provides some background on the war, its causes and combatants, and gives an overview of the Australian naval contribution. Where did it all begin? Preparations for a major European war were an integral part of the first decade of Australian nationhood. As part of the British Empire, a major conflict involving Britain would inevitably involve its newest dominion, Australia. On 4 October 1913, the Australian fleet unit consisting of warships built in Britain arrived in Sydney Harbour. Led by the powerful battle cruiser HMAS Australia, less than a year later, the newly established RAN was involved in what became a global conflict. To discuss the RAN's involvement in the war, I'm joined today by Rear Admiral James Goldricht of the Naval Studies Group, who is author of the Anderson Medal winning book, Before Jutland. Also joining us is Commodore Jack McCaffrey from Mildura, uh, also a member of the Naval Studies Group, who has written widely on Australian naval aviation in World War I. And finally, Dr David Stevens of the Australian War Memorial, who is the author of the Frank Bruce Prize winning book, In All Respects Ready, Australia's Navy in World War I. Gentlemen, thank you for making the time to speak with us today. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Firstly, James, the most Australians think of the First World War as Gallipoli and the Western Front but it had a very maritime flavour. Can you expand on that, please? The maritime part of the First World War was something that ran for the whole war, and it was a global war. And the maritime war was really the war of resources. The Allies were trying to use the globe's resources, um, the globe's ability to move materials and men around, and the central powers led by Germany were both trying to prevent that movement and also to find ways of accessing the globe's resources uh, in, the, uh, in opposition to the blockade that the Allies were attempting to impose on them. Certainly the, uh, the troops could never have got to Gallipoli or the Western Front if it wasn't for uh, those safe sea lines of communication. No, they couldn't. And I think one of the ways to think about the Western Front and indeed all the campaigns in Europe and elsewhere in the world was that they were all maritime enabled. And the Western Front was continually supplied um, by materials and men from overseas. And indeed, what I don't think is completely understood is that countries like France and Italy uh, were being supplied from overseas, coordinated by Britain, very much from the resources of the British Empire and Britain itself had available. Thank you. Jack. At the outbreak of the, uh, the war, uh, how big was the Royal Australian Navy? Uh, who commanded the Navy and, and who commanded the fleet? Um, well, Greg, um, the RAM was actually a pretty substantial force at, at the outbreak of the war, uh, in regional terms, certainly as far as the Indian and Pacific Oceans were concerned. Um, the manpower strength was about uh, 3,800 people, um, of whom some 900 uh, were uh, Royal Navy lone people. Uh, the fleet itself, I guess you could look at it in two halves. There were, there were 16 um, commissioned vessels, uh, including the two submarines. Um, one half of, of, of the fleet was, was the new build ships that made up the fleet unit led by the Battle Cruiser Australia, uh, while the rest, uh, the second half, really were the carryover ships from uh, the colonial state navies, uh, many of which actually served uh, right through the war. Okay, and um, and who was the who was commanding the fleet? Oh, sorry. And yes, the the, um, the the head of the navy um, from 
in fact, from about 1904 onwards till the end of the war was uh, Rear Admiral uh, Sir William Creswell, um, who became um, first naval member of the uh, Australian Commonwealth Naval Board in uh, March 1911. And um, the first flag officer commanding the Australian fleet was um, uh, Rear Admiral, in fact, he became Vice Admiral, uh, Sir George Patey, um, who brought the, the fleet unit out from, from UK in 1913. Yeah. So initially the... Uh the officers were mainly mainly British and some of the former colonial naval officers, but, uh, but most of the ratings were uh, generally Australians. That's true, and, and I think the, the, the aim was to make um, our people totally uh, interchangeable with Royal Navy people um, in, in, either, in either service. James. And I think one thing to point out about the officers of the Australian Navy who were Royal Navy, the Admiralty consistently made efforts to get people with an Australian connection or who are Australian born uh, to serve in and with the Australian Navy. Um, and you can see that in the officers in the Australia. Uh, for instance, mm -hmm. the later squadron commander, John Crace, uh, was the commissioning torpedo officer of the Battle Cruiser Australia, but he was born in Canberra. Hmm. That's great. David, what was the situation in the Pacific? Obviously, uh, there were German possessions to the north of Australia, and there was the, the German fleet in, in uh, East Asia fleet in China. How was that uh, an issue for Australia at the beginning of the war? Well, you've got to understand that it certainly wasn't a benign environment. And uh, once the war had started, we're really looking at contested seas around Australia. And the best thing that Australia ever did was invest in that um, battle cruiser, HMAS Australia, because the German East Asian uh, cruiser squadron, which you mentioned, was deterred from coming and attacking us in our waters because of the, they knew that they were um, far inferior to just the, the two major German um, armoured cruisers were inferior um, to the battle cruiser that we had. And that's a very important strategic lesson that we should learn about um, strategic deterrence. That didn't mean that the Germans weren't doing anything though. And um, in fact, they obviously were, their mission was to interfere with trade and uh, von Spey, the commander of the German squadron, released SMS Emden, who we'll probably hear of in another episode, um, to operate in the Indian Ocean, where she did great damage. And so there's these things going on. But from an Australian perspective, uh, especially from an Australian naval perspective, the idea was to try and um, track down and destroy the German East Asia cruiser squadron as soon as possible. And so the initial movements of the Australian fleet are all about trying to find the Germans where they are. Because you've got to remember, although they were, their main base was in Tsingtao in China, they were actually had anchorages all the way down into New Guinea in the German territories there. So you've got the, the German East Asia Cruiser Squadron and also, as you mentioned, the German possessions. And part of the, the overall mission to disrupt the Germans consists of destroying German communications by going and taking out their island territories, such as Nauru, um, the bit of Parker Wireless Station and um, several others in the region, mm -hmm. uh, Yap, for example. And uh, again, it wasn't just the Australians because there was also the British China Squadron and eventually the Japanese ships, which were also involved, all um, trying to prevent the Germans from carrying out their mission. And quite successfully, because the Germans decided, as I mentioned, deterred by, by the Australian presence, um, that the best thing for them to do was to move east across the Pacific and try and um, be a fleet in being for a while. Certainly some of the uh, revisionist historians now are saying that some meddling from, uh, from the UK in, uh, in Whitehall uh, kept some of the uh, British and Australian ships uh, too far west, which allowed Von Spey to uh, move to the coast of Chile and then fight the Battle of Coronel. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? I wouldn't say it was just revisionist historians, because at the time, the, um, certainly the, some of the people in uh, the ships, our ships, were saying we should be released to go and do what we want to chase these, these people, not just do um, all these, uh, these enemy ships, not just be directed by um, Whitehall, for example. But it was never a simple matter of that, because there's always far more moving pieces. And particularly when you're looking at that time period, when there's no radar, no real area surveillance, yeah. um, you're really, uh, as they found trying to hunt down Emden, it's very difficult to find a ship in the expanses of an ocean. Um, you're very, it's often only luck that you do come across it. And it tends to be a matter of 
um, knowing where it's been because of a destroyed ship or a, an appearance off a port rather than actually um, knowing where it was. And some of the plans that they were making to intercept the Germans were quite involved in that, um, for example, Australia was operating with a French ship Montcalm and they, rather than uh, Australia um, transmitting, they'd transmit through Montcalm to make it look like Montcalm was on her own. And so because Montcalm was inferior to the German ships, it was hoping to attract the Germans. So, so they're, an early form of cyber warfare there. They're, they're, doing, <coughs> they're doing quite interesting things. But um, the, the, yeah, so, but the main problem is you can't, it's very difficult to track down um, a ship in an ocean as big as the Pacific, even a large ship. Mm. And the idea that we could have um, found them by just going off and willy-nilly to search um, anchorages wasn't never going to be a, a, a goer. Very unlikely to do achieve anything. And the way they did do it, which was putting um, forces, say, out to Fiji as a barrier, and then bringing other forces from other areas of the globe to basically corner the Germans, which eventually happened off in the South Atlantic, was uh, quite a reasonable way to work it. And um, it was eventually successful. Thank you. Which leads me on to James to a question regarding the operation of the wireless stations and wireless uh, in general in warships. Australia was involved in, in breaking the German codes, I believe, at the beginning of the war. Um, Australia was certainly involved in that, but the most important Australian contribution turned out to be the capture of the merchant ships uh, code book, which was also the one used for small ships. And that became profoundly important um, in the North Sea because the Germans had the habit of sending the, both their setting up instructions and their executive instructions for fleet departure by radio. And what was happening would be the Brits were listening for transmissions which would include an instruction to the gate vessel to open the gate for 10 hours. So it wasn't that, that you know, you'd, you'd be saying that that the fleet is sailing, you would know that the gate was open, therefore the fleet was sailing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was a very important contribution. An even more important contribution was, in fact, a lot of the instructions to the German merchant ships as to what they were going to do and the outbreak of war and where they were going to go. Those were made very quickly available to the Admiralty, and there is evidence that uh, it was acknowledged how useful that had been in the first few weeks of war. Oh, good. David? Leading on from the uh, Von Spey's uh, actions in the Pacific, our first land action was in New Guinea at Rabaul. Could you uh, expand on that, please? Well, that was, again, based on trying to destroy um, or occupy the German territories, which the, um, uh, the British thought would be a very useful way of um, employing the Dominion forces, um, using the New Zealanders, often Samoa, and mm -hmm. ourselves in, in New Guinea. Um, to help the empire and actually sort of bring up a, um, a spirit that the dominions were doing something already in the war. And the, because of the Bitter Parker wireless station, which the, the Germans were using to operate and where you know, they could control their ships from, um, it was a reasonable target. And so we, it was our first um, joint and combined operation. In the, it, we, there were British ships, there were French ships, there were Australian troops, um, obviously of Australian naval presence. Um, move, we, uh, there was this, the Australian Naval and Military Expeditionary Force, which was especially a volunteer force, um, especially recruited to uh, carry out the, the occupation. And it was Australian Naval Reservists who actually did the initial landings in, um, in the Rabaul to, um, to uh, defeat the German um, troops on the ground. And it was a very interesting operation, um, just the sheer fact that we had something over 20 ships of a whole variety, and not just the warships, but we also had the submarines, um, supply ships, ammunition ships. They were able to carry out, it was very much a, let's form a mobile floating base up in New Guinea, which one will take out the German position, but then will be a very good base to subsequently um, go after the German ships if they're in the area. So our very first amphibious operation. Very, it's a lot of firsts in that operation. Um, as I said, first joint and combined, first amphibious, first naval gunfire support. Encounter was using her guns against, the, um, against German positions. Um, a lot of firsts, a lot of interesting lessons that came out of it. And of course, our first casualties. Mm -hmm. Leading on from that, uh, Jack, we have the actions in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean uh, against the Emden. 
uh, which became our first naval battle. Can you explain on that? Um, yes, Greg. Um, first of all, well, the battle was between um, HMAS Sydney and uh, the German cruiser Emden. But the context in which it took place uh, on the 9th of November 1914 was firstly that uh, Emden had been enjoying a very successful run as a, as a raider in the Indian Ocean, right across the, the northern part of the Indian Ocean, uh, but was beginning to feel uh, the heat as um, the Royal Navy was uh, doing its best to track it down. So um, Emden's Captain Von Muller decided to destroy the communication station at Cocos Island in order to make the job of the Royal Navy that much more difficult. And the other side of it was that um, Sydney was part of the um, uh, escort for the first of the troop convoys um, from Australia and New Zealand to the Mediterranean, and that, that actually sailed from Western Australia on the 1st of November. Now, um, Emden wasn't aware of um, uh, the, the convoy's presence, and I guess in a sense it was just fortuitous that um, the convoy was in the vicinity of Cocos when uh, Emden uh, appeared um, off the island um, and uh, caused a signal to be sent from the communication station, which was intercepted by uh, both ships within the convoy itself and by, and by the escorts. Uh, that uh, signal led to Sydney being dispatched from uh, the convoy uh, to the islands and, of course, came, ac came across the Emden. Um, a, a relatively brief, I guess, uh, gun battle took place. Um, Emden scored the first hits um, and the only casualties that, that Sydney uh, endured during the action very early on, but um, as Sydney then began, began to take advantage of um, her heavier and longer-ranging um, guns, um, created uh, havoc uh, on, on the Emden. And I think by about 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, the engagement was pretty well over and uh, the captain of the Emden decided to, to beach the ship uh, uh, on North Keeling Island. Um, there were um, subsequent events, some of which uh, have generated some controversy. If, uh, we can go into those two if you wish. Yes, uh, I understand that uh, there may have been a situation where uh, Glossop in command of Sydney uh, was forced to open fire on the, on the grounded vessel. Yeah, that, because... that's, that, yeah that, that's the main one, I guess. That, um, w once um, the Emden was beached, um, Sydney went after, bereft the, uh, the collier that was associated with Emden and once uh, ca came across that ship, found that it was scuttled, um, put, put some boats in the water to help rescue the crew and then went back to um, Emden and that's when the, the second very brief engagement occurred because Emden's ensign was still flying and there were some, um, let's say, inconclusive communications between the two ships which led to Sydney opening fire until um, the ensign was hauled down and uh, um, a white flag of some kind was shown. Thanks, Jack. James, we've had our first tactical victory at sea. Uh, with the Sydney End in action, were there any operational strategic impact? Oh, the operational and strategic impact of the destruction of the End alone was extremely important. Although they were still a little unsure as to where some of the other German raiders were um, at the time, in particular on the other side of the Indian Ocean, uh, Emden's being removed meant that the uh, communications within the Indian Ocean Theatre in Southeast Asia uh, were restored uh, because by that stage uh, they'd had the defeat at Coronel, they knew where the East Asiatic Squadron was. Mm. It also, it only just preceded um, the success at uh, the Falkland Islands by a few weeks, but it was a very important um, morale boost for uh, the Navy and when I use the word Navy, I mean the British Navy as well as the Australian Navy. Mm -hmm. um, it was a clear success at a time where people have been quite depressed by the events of the previous few weeks. So, and it also had an important um, impact, and David's touched on it in his um, observations about the New, New Guinea campaign. It was also telling both Britain and Germany that Britain could call on the resources Mm -hmm. of an empire that was more than an empire. In other words, that there were actually these other young nations which were contributing and being able to do things substantially in their own right. And I think that was an important message uh, internationally. So the whole was more than just the sum of its parts? The whole was very much more than the sum, sum of the parts. Yeah. And you can see the, the, the comments that are being made, not simply in the media, but in, people, in letters um, of people who matter.
uh, that this has been realised. Um, and, and it's an important event. David? I think, I, um, yes, Jack. I, I, I guess I could just add, I think um, whether it's directly related or not, um, I, I think there was, there was no instance of, of any loss of, of life or any loss of any ships to enemy action in the Indian Ocean amongst the convoys and the troop convoys for the rest of the war. That's true, yeah. So we've, we've maintained or we've gained sea control almost of the entire globe uh, in a very quick period of time. Yes, indeed. The, once the Falkland Islands battle um, has occurred and the um, Königsberg uh, had been found up in an African river and the British, there was a final cruise in the Atlantic, the Karlsruhe, which um, had blown up and it took some time to work out that it happened. But really, once uh, you've cleared um, von Spee's East Asiatic Squadron and the few armed merchant ships the Germans were able to get together at the beginning of the war, the, the Allies have global maritime control. And the sea war almost becomes confined to the, to the North Sea and the Mediterranean. It's the Mediterranean, it's the North Sea, it's the Baltic. Um, and those are, the, those are the main theatres. Now the Germans become increasingly aware of this. The irony is that although we have global maritime control, because of the commercial systems and it's a globalised world, what in fact is happening is that Germany is still trading with the rest of the world but through the neutrals around it. And there's extraordinary amount of trading going on, not just from America but from British interests, um, basically to make money. The Germans don't completely realise this. Uh, there's considerable indignation in Germany about that they seem to be shut off, and that starts to create the driver for some sort of campaign in response, which leads to the U-boat war. David, the Emden's been sunk, uh, Rabol's been captured, the RAN has become scattered to the, to the four winds in some respects. Where were the other areas of operation for the RAN for the remainder of the war? Well, well as you said, the, the RAN became scattered and the only reason it could become scattered is because of these, these victories. And it's one thing to establish sea control, another thing to maintain it. And there's a whole range of other operations that have to be done, not just the battle war fighting type operations. And we saw our submarine um, AE2, we'd lost one submarine in, in the Rabaul campaign, AE1. AE2 then headed off to um, the eastern Mediterranean where it um, took part in the, um, as you were aware, on the uh, entry into the Dardanelles on the 25th of April 25th, uh, 1915 mm -hmm. as part of the, of the Gallipoli campaign and was then unfortunately lost in the Sea of Mamara, but she was the first Allied submarine through the Dardanelles. The battlecruiser Australia was sent up to um, the, to join the, the second battlecruiser squadron in the North Sea, operating out of Recife. The two modern cruisers, Sydney and Melbourne, um, ended up off in the West Indies station where they were helping to track down some of those um, armed merchant cruisers. And then were involved in um, maintaining the, the watch over American ports and some of the neutral ports in the Caribbean to make sure that German merchant ships who were interned or didn't escape into the open ocean either armed or, in fact, just to get back to Germany. Um, and then you had Pioneer, which was a, one of our second, or well, it was our, uh, a protected cruiser, uh, a bit of an older vessel, which ended off, um, as James mentioned, um, the uh, Königsberg in the Refugee Delta in, in um, East Africa. Pioneer went there um, to help that blockade and destroy that vessel. So we're actually all over the world and it is a glo it's still a global campaign. Um, we have, and for a small navy to have our ships in the, the West Indies, the North Sea, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, the East African coast and still patrolling our own coast, it's quite an amazing feat for, as Jake mentioned, 16 or so vessels. Yeah. James, but the, the main effort I think was still in the North Sea and uh, from 1916 onwards, and Australian vessels were certainly involved there. Yes, the North Sea was very much two fleets in being which could not grapple with each other, and why they couldn't was because neither the German nor the British fleet were willing to go to where the other would have most advantage. So the British would not move their fleet in towards the inner Heligoland Bight, where the Germans, originally their operational concept was that's where they'd fight their battle.
the Germans, because they were the weaker force, were not going to go far out into the North Sea, and indeed Jutland, although the Germans claimed it with good reason as a tactical success, um, was for them clearly an operational and strategic confirmation that they could not really face the, the, grand, the grand fleet. They didn't have the strength. And an American journalist summed it up very well when he said after the Battle of Jutland, given the British losses, that the German uh, fleet has assaulted its jailer, but it's still in jail. Mm. What is also important to remember is that you've also got the Baltic. The Germans, in fact, have a multi-front problem. And the Germans have always to think about the Russians, who have a very defensive attitude, but always would have the potential uh, which they hardly ever exploited to make life very difficult for the Russians and the Baltic, for the Germans in the Baltic. Um, but it is this: what you really have is multiple fleets in being, and um, it's the existence of the fleets in being which allows both the Germans uh, to create and then sustain a U-boat campaign, because the British cannot get the U-boats at source. They can't. Um, they end up doing things to try and reduce it, but they can't stop the U-boats coming. Similarly, the Germans cannot break the increasing Allied stranglehold on them, the increasingly effective blockade, uh, because the Grand Fleet is there protecting all the activities which David is talking about. Mm. Now, you mentioned briefly the Battle of Jutland. I, I certainly recall, I don't think any Australian ships were at Jutland. There were no Australian ships at Jutland. Uh, HMS Australia had, uh, although she was a member of the second battle cruiser squadron, had a collision uh, a few months before in April um, with the battle cruiser New Zealand. And although Australia hit New Zealand, it was Australia which was the more damaged ship. Okay. Um, and she was just completing the repairs and, in fact, I think was on her way back to rejoin the Grand Fleet um, when the battle took place. So Australia. Uh, did not take part in the battle, and the other, Sydney and Melbourne, didn't, hadn't joined the fleet. There were Australians, uh, both RAN um, people, but also many Australian born in the fleet, and indeed uh, some Australians died uh, in the battle, uh, including, I think, in the armoured cruiser Defence, uh, which blew up, was one of the catastrophic uh, destructions. I will say that Australia, which had arrived in the North Sea too late for the early actions, such as the Dogger Bank and the Heligoland Bight, and Miss Jutland, I think was nicknamed the conscientious objector um, by the rest of the battle cruisers, uh, which would not have gone, gone down well with her ship's company. Mm. Jack, um, the First World War was the, uh, uh, the first conflict where aviation uh, really came to the fore. Could you expand on, uh, on the role that uh, naval aviation played during the, the conflict? Well, as, as far as the RAN was concerned, um, the role was very limited, but I think it's worth um, making the point initially that uh, the RAN did uh, get the hang of, of, of the potential of, navigation, of naval aviation very early, and indeed um, the budget estimates for 1914-15 year made provision for um, a small naval air service and a depot ship. Uh, worth also, I think, mentioning that um, despite the interest, the evident interest in, in naval aviation within the RAN at that early point, um, what did occur, at the extent to which the Navy became involved in aviation during the war, owed as much, I think, to um, operational circumstance and individual initiative on the part of certain ship COs as it did to any, any um, organisational imperative. And I think that the third point I'd make before going into any sort of uh, specific detail is that um, none of the, the activity, the, the aviation activity in which the RAM was involved during the war was in any way militarily decisive. It tended to be more um, um, what's the word, experimental perhaps, than, than anything else. And the, the three um, ways in which the, the Navy did use uh, aviation uh, were for um, reconnaissance, um, uh, for anti-submarine warfare, and I guess what we uh, call now um, combat air patrol. And I can, I can give some examples of, of, of each of those. And the, the first would be, um, I guess, with uh, HMAS Brisbane in the Indian Ocean, uh, when she uh, embarked uh, a float plane from um, HMS Raven for a couple of weeks of um, searching for, for a German raider and the, the aircraft apparently operated uh, one or two sorties a day for those two weeks uh, without actually finding anything but um, it certainly made um, an impression on uh, the ship's CEO, Captain Tumbledge, 
who became a, a very strong proponent of aviation as, as a result of that. Um, the ASW, um, I guess the, the primary example of that would be um, the way in which uh, our destroyers, which were involved in the Atranto barrage in late 1917 onwards, um, used uh, tethered uh, manned um, observation balloons um, for ASW for submarine searches. Um, and th these destroyers tended to operate in pairs, so one would have uh, the balloon for searching and the other would be available to respond to, uh, to any sightings that were made, a, a kind of hunter-killer group, I guess. Um, and again, while um, I think there were reports of submarine sightings having been made from this, I don't think there was actually any um, successful attack carried out as a result of it. And the final one, the um, Combat Air Patrol, um, comes about because um, both the, the cruisers, uh, such as uh, Sydney and Melbourne, and even uh, the Battle Cruiser Australia, uh, were involved in some of the very early attempts uh, at using aircraft uh, at sea, for, um, flying either from the deck, as was the case with Australia, at least once or twice, but more often from uh, platforms um, above uh, some of the gun turrets. And I guess the most the most famous of those um, uh, examples was uh, the um, occurrence on the 1st of June in 1918 when um, Sydney's aircraft was involved in the chase of um, some German bombers that had attacked uh, the Harwich force, of which it was a part, and um, Flight Lieutenant Charland, uh, who was flying the, uh, the Sopwith Camel from Sydney, um, actually engaged uh, the bombers and came very close to, to scoring a, a kill. I mean, as, as far as we know, he did shoot uh, German aircraft down, but was unable to um, confirm that the aeroplane had crashed, and so um, it, it was not a confirmed kill. But um, that would have been perhaps the first um, kill by um, an, aircraft, an embarked aircraft had it, had it been confirmed. So you can see that there's a, there's a broad span uh, of, of activities, but uh, as I said at the beginning, nothing really decisive in any military sense. It certainly lit the spark for naval aviation to uh, occur uh, some decades later. It, it did, but it certainly was a spark that, yeah, it, it took a long time to catch fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, Jack's just mentioned, mentioned uh, the Australian destroyers in, in the Mediterranean and also Sydney and, and Melbourne were in the North Sea by the latter part of the war. What were they actually doing? Well, once we'd, we'd mentioned before about how we'd spread out around the world and as the, the situation changed, um, the ships came uh, or tended to focus in the North Sea, particularly the cruisers in Australia and then the destroyers in the Mediterranean. And the, the cruisers had gone up there because after Jutland, the, the German had, Germans had lost most of their mo or several of their modern light cruisers and the, the British felt that there was no way they'd be able to release them to go around the world and therefore much better to have the modern Australian light cruisers working with the British fleet in the North Sea. And once they're there, they're doing um, patrols, no, um, dark night patrols they often call them, which were tending, trying to intercept Germans coming out of the, the Skagerrak, whether it's raiders or submarines or um, occasional merchantmen. Um, those sort of sweeps through the North Sea, um, hoping to come across something. Um, it's a matter of maintaining presence and, and showing that you're there, showing that you control the area, um, so that often you're, you're not going to get results, but the sheer fact that they don't come across any German ships indicates that the patrols are working. Um, and so th those, those are the sort of things they tend to do, and eventually later on, once the convoy system is really up and running, between the, the British convoy system, between Scandinavia and, and the north of England, the Australian ships, such as Australia and the, the, the um, cruisers, are up there providing distant escort often, um, tracking the convoys from one end to the other. And occasionally they do come across submarines and engage in, in um, submarine battles, but again, not necessarily successful, but if you're there, you're helping to protect the, um, the convoys and the main thing is not to kill the submarine but to make sure the convoy gets through to the end. Mm. Uh, similarly in the Mediterranean, the, our destroyers were, had been operating on the China station, helping there to um, show the flag presence, prevent German plots um, to raise indigenous rebellions.
But after that, they were sent to the Mediterranean because of the, the desperate need for escorts in the Mediterranean against the German and the Austrian U-boat threat. And that's where, how they ended up in the Otranto barrage, protecting the ships of that barrage um, against either the German Austrian submarines or even Austrian surface ships. And there were occasions where there was encounters, certainly with um, all those enemy forces. Which leads me on to my almost final question, James. The end of the war uh, occurs in 1918, but for some reason, some of the Australian destroyers end up in southern Russia, in the wound up in the Civil War. So, can you, what happened there? Well, it was a, a progressive um, event in that the Australian destroyers were part of the Allied fleet, which goes to enforce the uh, armistice uh, and the peace terms with Turkey. Uh, so you have Australian destroyers moving through the Bosphorus um, and into the Sea of Marmara and then into the Black Sea. But following that, you get the Allied intervention um, to support uh, the white forces against the Bolsheviks in Russia. And uh, that is a campaign which sees naval support of intervention in the Crimea um, over a period. It wasn't successful, um, but it certainly did get Australian ships to unexpected places. Mm. Well, gentlemen, is there any one thing that uh, you think stands out uh, about Australia's role in, in, uh, in the First World War? And I'll, I'll go to Jack first. Uh, well, I, I'd like to just make a further comment about um, that spark on, on naval aviation. Um, it was, I, I thought it intriguing, at least, that um, by the end of 1970, uh, the RAN had, had asked the Royal Navy for, for costing for um, four aircraft and a loan of air and ground crews to, to help uh, man and support them, and was told basically that uh, the, RN, the RN couldn't spare either the aircraft or the people, and that the RAN should approach the USN for aircraft um, to see whether, whether they could satisfy it. And I, I think that's about as close as we got to having a, a naval air arm um, for some decades. And uh, I think it was the, the combination of that, that initial rebuff plus um, the, the end of the war and subsequent financial stringency plus uh, the, the struggle with, with Air Force then uh, for control of military aircraft uh, that, that led to the, the spark and going very dimly for very many years before it finally did catch light. Thank you, Jack. David. Yeah, that's, I mean, there's so many <laughs> to, to mention, but just that, um, if I could reinforce that point about the, um, the Navy was um, formed um, in existence, had, was up and running well before the First World War. Um, it wasn't a volunteer force recruited after the war had broken out. Um, it was ready for anything and it did everything um, all over the world very successfully. Um, Again, when you look at the First World War, you don't tend to talk about it in terms of a good war. But the Royal Australian Navy had a very good war. It lost very few people. It was successful in all the operations it undertook and um, established a, a extremely um, useful reputation around the world. And it's really the bedrock of our subsequent traditions, that, those operations in the First World War. Thanks. James? I think the First World War should confirmed to us that the strategic realities for Australia haven't changed. Australia is a country which is dependent on a global system which is trading uh, to which we can export and from what, we, from what we can import and our security is not simply about territorial defence, it's about the protection of that system and if it's threatened or in a conflict the need for us to be able to um, support and help protect the movement of resources, materials and people um, to achieve whatever is needed elsewhere. That's both in military terms and also for our own economic and national existence. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Sadly, that's all we have time for today. Uh, many thanks to James, David and, and Jack uh, for their insights and many thanks to you for joining us. We look forward to your company for our next podcast. Please visit the UNSW Canberra Naval Studies Group website for details on other podcasts in this series. Bye for now.